Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to this service of worship at First United Methodist Church of Sanford. We are excited to welcome you here in person and online. However it is that you are worshiping today, we are so glad to be in community together with one another. My name is Megan Killingsworth. I'm one of the two pastors here, and I am so glad that we have a chance. It's chilly this morning, right? Um, I'm so glad we have a chance to be together, to be in worship, um, and to be warm. Before we get started, I've got a couple of announcements for us. Um, some of it is boring church business, and some of it is answered prayers, and I'll let you decide which is which. Um, <laughs> First, I want you to know that every United Methodist Church in the Florida Conference is required every year to complete an independent audit. Now, this may sound like boring stuff, but as your pastor, I want you to know that as a church, we have financial responsibility and checks and balances in place because I think God and stewardship deserves that. So any church you ever go to, you should hope there is an audit and that that audit is accessible to anybody in the church. And I want you to know that this week we had our audit. We passed it with flying colors. Hooray. And yay. Um, and that financial information is available to any person who asks. We do not have financial secrets here at the church. Any church you go to, the, the finances should be open book. And so we want you to know that if that's something you're interested in, I will send you the document from our auditor and anything else that you think is important for you to see because as a church, we believe that honoring stewardship really, really matters. I also want you to know that this week... Um, we received our letter of um, permission from the city of Sanford to move forward with our co-op project. Yay! Now, you may know that we've um, had some back and forth with planning and zoning. We've been working with the city to try and figure out how we can get all the right permissions in place, how we can make sure that we're being a good neighbor to all folks and that we can extend the ministry of our co-op. It's a shared space for nonprofit and social enterprise groups who want to do good in the city of Sanford. And we've had a couple of bumps in the road. And this week, and I know many of you have been praying about this, one of those bumps was removed. And so we've got an official letter. There's a seal and there's a signature. So we're going to blow it up. We're going to hang it in the office. I am so excited. The city has, um, has moved forward with us and we're really grateful to them. So thank you for all of you who've been praying about the co-op and about ways that God is in encouraging us and calling us to engage in our neighborhood. My last announcement is that tonight, um, our Be the Bridge study um, will begin on Zoom. So if you are interested, it's a, a book by Latasha Morrison on um, God's way of racial reconciliation, and it's called Be the Bridge. Um, it is available digitally on Amazon, so if you haven't ordered the book but you want to come tonight, uh, you could read it online, the, the first little chapter. Um, if you're interested or have any questions, feel free to see me after the service. Friends, I'll now invite us to turn our hearts toward the God who is bigger and grander, who is wider and deeper and stronger than all that we could ever ask or imagine, a God who loves you so much that God was waiting here for you this morning. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Open my ears that I may hear. Voices of truth thou sendest clear. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Illumine me, spirit divine. So, Moses, uh, uh, Adam approaches God and he says, you know, he says, it's boring around here living by myself. He says, I'm, I, I'm really, really bored. God says, I've been anticipating this problem. He says, I have a solution for you. He says, I will create a woman for you. He said, she will be the perfect human being. She will take care of your every need. She will cook for you. She will clean for you. She will take care of your clothes. She'll watch TV with you. She'll drink a beer with you. She'll be able to discuss sports, anything you want to discuss. She'll be perfect. Adam says, well, what's that going to cost me? <laughs> God says, an arm and a leg. <laughs> Adam says, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> and that's when the trouble started. <laughs> A 
Our first scripture this morning is Psalms 22, 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. He has not despised nor disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. From, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who will go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness for the pe to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. The word of God for the people of God. We now have opportunity to pray together uh, with one another, and I would encourage you to grab your prayer request sheet that's in your bulletin. Um, those are folks who have asked us to pray for them, and as you know, this church takes very seriously prayer and the call to pray for one another, and so I would invite you not only to take this with you um, during our prayers today, but to take it with you during your prayers at home this week. Let us pray together. Holy God, we showed up this morning because we are looking for something outside of ourselves. Lord, we can try our very best and we will fail. We can find ourselves in a whole hot mess. We can find ourselves just as kind of a pile of feelings on the floor. We can be in our proudest days and on our worst days, Lord, and still we have this sneaking suspicion that all that we are is not enough without you. Lord, we showed up today because we are seeking you, and so we ask that you would bend your ear toward us, that you would hear the cries of your people, that you would respond, that you would remind us, God, that you are always there. Lord, we lift up to you prayers for those who are seeking healing. For those who are awaiting a diagnosis or receiving treatment, for those who are in hospitals and rehab facilities, for those dealing with COVID, for all those on the front lines, our health workers, for everyone who is seeking healing, Lord, we pray to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up to you prayers for those who are seeking discernment and wisdom. Lots of us know what it's like to not know what is ahead of us, to be seeking places to live and new jobs, to be seeking the right way forward, to be seeking you. God, we lift up to you prayers for people who want to know what is next and how to be faithful. We lift up these prayers to you. Lord, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those who are lonely or who find themselves far from people that they love. It is a human experience to be lonely, Lord. And we know it's not only dangerous for our health, but it is a dark place for us to find ourselves. And so, especially in a pandemic when we've been far from people that we love, especially in a highly divided society, especially for those who are in foster care and those who are in our jails and prisons, especially for those who travel for work or who serve in the military. Lord, we pray for all those who are dealing with loneliness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for our enemies. We pray for those who seek to do us harm. We pray for those with whom we have highly broken relationships. We pray for those people who create in us nothing but knots in our guts. We pray for those people we don't like. People who don't like us because we need to. Lord, we lift up prayers for our enemies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we lift up prayers for thanksgiving and celebration. We always want to be the folks who return and say thank you because we know that you have heard our prayers. We celebrate all the ways that we've seen your kingdom breaking in, showing up, being good. We lift up these prayers of gratitude. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lay at your feet all that we wonder about. We lay at your feet all of the pain and suffering that we and those we love are carrying. We lay at your feet the joy and celebration of our lives. Lord, turn our hearts to you. Turn our minds and our actions and our lives toward you. And help in all that we do that this church would be a place that not only honors you, but shows your love to the world. Lord, help us to start right here in Sanford. All these prayers we ask in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Our second reading, our second reading today is also from the Old Testament. It's Exodus 20, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall now not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of God for the people of God. There's something about a little perspective, isn't there? I've got uh, three friends who have recently driven across the country in the last two months, and they put their finger on something special in their reflections. Actually, this morning, my grandma and my aunt are driving across the country. So um, they're driving from Florida to Oregon, so maybe they'll have some good reflections for us when they get back. When each of these people has talked about their experience, seeing the vastness of the country, traveling through lots of different weather patterns and time zones, there's been somewhat of a description of transcendence. In a moment of adventure, of grief or transition, there's something that that gets your head right with all those hours of landscape and silence and distance. There's something beautiful about being reminded of how small we are and how big everything else is. The farthest I've ever driven was from Dallas to Tallahassee in a single day. And um, in a strange moment, my friend and I had everything that he owned in his manual white Ford F-150. And we had already passed through the second caffeine crash of the day. And we pull up to this gas station somewhere in Louisiana... All of his stuff is strapped down in the back of his truck. And we are belting out at the top of our lungs with the windows down. Kelly Clarkson's um, Since You've Been Gone. Is that anyone else's jam? Um, And we look over and like, you know, this is a major moment of transition in his life. And we're like crying and singing and on a caffeine crash. And we have all of his stuff. And we look across the gas station. And there's two people in a U-Haul with the windows down singing along with us. It's almost like in this moment we kind of understood, like, this is, a, this is a big moment. And life is big and small and so connected and universal at the same time. Can you remember the last time that you looked up at the stars? The last moment that you felt this sense of awe? Or how about a time when you found yourself so far from home, but yet feeling so connected with the people who were around you? Stumbling on godness usually produces in me a mix of awe and gratitude and silence. For me, that's kind of the marker, right? That's kind of the sail in the wind that tells me, pay attention, God is here. The world is so big and yet so small. God is so concerned with the details 
but also so vast. God connects us. And my, my response in my heart is this gratitude and awe and silence. Let's pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. God, who shows up in burning bushes and in running water, in still small voices and in booming storms, meet us here, Lord. Amen. Now, we heard... Uh, the second half of Psalm 22, that's what Larry read for us today. And um, I want to read it for us in the messages translation because I think Eugene Peterson's interpretation does something in our contemporary language. Here's the story I'll tell my friends when they come to worship and punctuate it with hallelujahs. Shout hallelujah, you God worshipers. Give glory, you sons of Jacob. Adore him, you daughters of Israel. He's never let you down. Never looked the other way when you were being kicked around. He's never wandered off to do his own thing. He's been right there, listening. Here in this great gathering for worship, I have discovered this praise life, and I'll do what I promised right here in front of all the God worshipers. Down and outers sit at God's table and eat their fill. Everyone on the hunt for God is here praising him. From the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses. They're running back to God. Long-lost families are falling on their faces before him. God has taken charge. From now on, he has the last word. All the power mongers are before him, worshiping. All the poor and powerless, too, worshiping. Along with those who never got it together, worshiping our children and their children will get in on this as the word is passed along from parent and to child babies not even conceived yet will hear the good news that god does what he says as i read those words it seemed to me that the psalm is a deeply human cry to this good god and I think that's true, right? We can hear these words of praise, and it sounds kind of like a song that we could sing or a psalm that we might have, have heard something similar to before, but I think there's something unique today. We know that it's true. God lets down and outers feast at the table. God's family extends way before and way after the psalmist's experience. The powerful and the powerless find themselves on equal footing worshiping this God. All of that is true but the gut punch of this psalm is that it's connected to what comes before it the beginning part of psalm 22 starts like this my god my god why have you forsaken me This is, of course, the psalm that Jesus prays from the cross. And lots of us probably know what it's like to pray this psalm. Maybe not these exact words, maybe not in this exact way, but we know what it's like to cry out. God, have you left me? Did you go somewhere else? Are you hiding? Have you abandoned us? I thought there was justice and goodness with you, but Lord, I'm having a hard time finding it. I'm having a hard time finding you this declaration of who god is that we read today is even more powerful because it is spoken precisely in the moment of gut-wrenching pain in this psalmist's life this week our focus is on not missing god Last week we talked about not worshiping our stuff, not getting stuff in the wrong order. 
in our relationships with all the other things in the world. And this week, we're talking about what it means to have a right relationship with God. Now, I don't know about you, but my temptation is to make a list, right? Maybe we want to make a list and we just make sure that God is at the top of it. We want to think of the biggest thing and then just make sure that God is like a little bigger than that thing. We want to cherish the best things about human life and then just supersize it, right? And then that's God. But the truth is, even in some of our most critical scriptures, some of the most memorable moments with God, even God struggles to communicate in a way that we can understand what God is like. When Moses sees the burning bush and learns that he is to go and confront Pharaoh and free the enslaved people from Egypt, he says, God, who do I tell him sent me? God says, I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. In the ancient church, there were folks who wanted to practice remembering how little we can understand about God or control about God. And so they developed this certain kind of theology. It's called apophatic theology. That'll be our, our big word for today. I had to look it up. I did not remember what it was called. <laughs> apophatic theology is something that's embraced in the Eastern church. A lot of Orthodox churches use it. And it's this way of approaching God, of talking about God by what we know is not the case. Because God is so big and so different from what we can understand, we've just got to be sure of what is not true and we let the mystery of God dwell. One example of apophatic theology is something like, God is not bound by space or time. Or, God cannot be entirely described with human language. One scholar who practices this type of theology explained that apophatic theology is important because it's a way of us trying to avoid some type of intellectual idolatry. If I can just think this thing right, if I can just figure out this one more little detail, if I can just study a little while longer. The, the smartest folks in all the world with the biggest words and the most degrees cannot fully describe a God who says, unless you are like a little child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. I think the Ten Commandments that we heard this morning, the first portion of, they hint at this. God says, don't have any other gods and don't make any other gods and don't worship anything else, including your work. God knew we would have a temptation to do that. But God doesn't say, this is me, right? Check the boxes and we'll be good. God doesn't say, follow steps one, two, and three in the self-help section of your local bookstore and I will appear like a genie. It makes me wonder, maybe all that God can ask of us is to make sure we don't let anything else get in the way. Maybe God knows that we are made to worship and God is always there and our job is to try to make space to see it. I don't know about you. But I'm not interested in worshiping a God that can be fully conceived inside of my tiny little brain. I got a way of going wayward, of creating things in ways I would like for them to go. And in trying to make God in my own image, I am enticed by a mysterious God that asks me simply to make space for God's presence because that is a God I cannot control. The psalmist invites us to even examine what we suspect about God. And I think the psalmist answers those suspicions. I love it because it is this psalmist's moment of suffering, precisely in the moment of suffering, that this psalmist is, is himself wondering, where are you, God, and what's going on, and have you forsaken me? And the second half of this psalm seems to ground him. 
this steady presence of God, this faithful rescuer, God, this loving parent, God, this always everywhere God, there. What is it that we suspect about God, especially in our deep moments of suffering like the psalmist? I found myself suspecting all these things, so if you're with me, there are words for us today. Have we been abandoned, we suspect? God, have you actually been there? Were you ever there? And the psalm answers, he has never let you down. He has never looked the other way when you were being kicked around. He has never wandered off to just do his own thing. He's been right there listening. We suspect God's got a list and we're not on it. And we hear in the psalm, down and out or sit at God's table and eat their fill. Everyone on the hunt for God is here praising him. All the power mongers are before him worshiping. All the poor and powerless too worshiping. Along with those who never got it together worshiping. We suspect God's occasionally a neat little thing that we can carry around. Just keep to ourselves. And we hear the psalmist say, from the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses and running back to God. Long lost families are falling on their faces before him, worshiping. How do we get God in the right order, friends? How do we not miss out on God amongst us? How do we be in right relationship with God? It is not about more. It's about less. Less in our way. It's about removing the things that can distract us because when everything else is gone, when we are empty and we are silent and we are unsure about anything else, God. God is there and has been there. We can't put God in the right order. We can only make sure that we don't make God out of anything else because God is so God, so other than what we can understand, that all we can do is approach with humility. Our job is to surrender to God's holy otherness. We can't right-think our way or right-list our way to this God. We can only surrender to the gratitude, to the silence, to the awe. In getting God in the right order, our job is simply to know that God is unlike anything else. And God is there. During the pandemic, right after my best friend died, I was a hot mess of grief. I called my spiritual director and I said, "Um, Meru, I want you to know I feel nothing. I can preach God and I know the things that are true about God, but in my moments of trying to get my spiritual practices right, I'm telling you, I'm trying to get up earlier, I'm trying to read, you know, I was pregnant at the time. I was like, Meru, if I get woken up at three o'clock in the morning, I figure maybe that's God and I'm trying to listen and then, and then I try to make sure that I've done all the things that God has asked me to do. I feel nothing. She said to me, Megan, isn't turning toward God enough? God's not an exercise routine. This is God we're talking about. A God who can't be bound. A God who can't be nailed down forever. A God who cannot be lost. You don't have to do something else. Breathe in. That's God. Friends, our invitation this week It's not about getting it right, getting it together, making a list. Our invitation this week is to look around us and see the God 
of the universe. Waiting. Loving. There. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, friends, we get to practice one of the most incredible rituals a community can do together. We get to eat with God. A table that God made, a table that God furnished, a table that God blesses, and all we have to do is show up. We already have the hands, friends. Let us just open them. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live at peace with God and one another. Therefore, let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we make gods out of other things because it is easier to control and understand. God, we confess that we would like to find a way to create a box to keep you in because that is a God we can grasp. Lord, we confess that we have made you in our image and used that image to hurt ourselves and other people. And for all of these things, God, we are sorry. Heal us, Lord. Cleanse us and make us a people who see you and know you. Amen. Friends, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread and broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it and remember me. And after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to them and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you And for many, for the forgiveness of sins, as often as you drink it, remember me. And so, holy God, we ask that you would make these gifts at your table from your hands. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Lord, we pray, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ's final victory and your heavenly banquet. Meet us here, Lord, in these elements, and whisper to us the reminder that you are God. Amen. Friends, in the United Methodist Church, all people are invited to God's table. This is your first time or your 1,000th time. If you feel like you deserve the prime seat here or you barely drug yourself in because you're not sure what you even believe, I want you to know that this table is a table from God, a gift for you that says you are so loved, you are so important, and you are so seen by the God of the universe. But let's eat. I would invite all who are interested in receiving the elements. I will come to your place and I will serve you there. You can just have your hands ready like this. If for some reason you don't want to receive, you can put your hands across your heart like this and I'll say a prayer for you. Uh, Whatever way you want to engage this morning, I want you to know that God showed up to tell you, you don't have to do anything but listen and be here. Amen.
awe, gratitude, silence. The bigness, the smallness, the connectedness. May we this week be people who take our shoes off on holy ground, who breathe in deeply the gift of breath from the Lord and who see God waiting for us there. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.